Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Ontario Canada's uh, 2021 fourth quarter virtual meeting here. Um, we have a great event kind of planned for everybody here. And we're just gonna step through a couple things before we go ahead and get started. Um, we've got, uh, Bert is going to be presenting for us. Um, and so currently he's kind of controlling the slides. So we're just gonna go ahead and step through a few things. So we're gonna get and start off with our agenda. If you could go to the next slide, please. So you can kind of see here, um, we're gonna keep things a little bit tight. We're gonna try and respect everybody's time. Um, we're gonna run through a quick greeting and start things off. Then we're gonna have a presentation from Bert. Um, before we have Polar, who is our generous sponsor, um, they're gonna go ahead and do a quick demo, hopefully at the end of the event. We're then gonna go ahead and wrap things up with a quick Q&A discussion. Um, and then finally, we have a raffle at the end of the day. Um, which includes some items both from Polar as well as from the PCEA. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so for those of you who have not uh, been a part of the PCEA before, um, welcome. Um, we're going to have a presentation from Bert uh, Simonovic. Um, please ensure that you have your microphones muted, although I believe that's kind of covered. And if you do have any questions, please go ahead and post those into the Q&A section as we kind of go through today's event. Um, if we don't have a chance to get to everybody's details, we will go ahead and follow up with you via email. Um, and just so you're aware, we are going ahead and we are recording this presentation um, so that we can go ahead and provide this at a later point in time. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so a brief overview of the PCA. Uh, the PCA is the Printed Circuit Engineering Association. Um, our goal is to collaborate, inspire, and then educate with other members inside of the printed circuit industry. And you can kind of see here, we have a detailed mission statement of who we are and what we're trying to do. Um, and we're wanting to really reach out and educate and be a part of all of those different stages in the PCB design process. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The PCA uh, originally when started and was founded in the January of 2020 um, as a trade association in the electronics industry. Um, we are incorporated as a not-for-profit. Um, and as I kind of want to said, our goal here is to reach out and serve those within our industry. So we have a few different uh, benefits, um, free membership. We also are currently growing rather rapidly and have a large membership um, both over North America also Europe and over the rest of the world. We have a variety of different CAD companies, Polar being one of them who's generous, generous enough to sponsor our event today, who have joined up to assist us in this association. We're also partnered with a couple of other trade associations um, and several trade publications as well. Next slide, please. My name is Thomas Chester. Um, I'm actually the chairman of the uh, Ontario Canada PCA chapter. Um, I'm actually also an executive board member on the executive board of the PCA. Um, I own my own company um, and in my spare time uh, or as part of my company, I go ahead and do training for Ultium in their essentials and advanced courses. Next slide, please. Our other two chapter members who are on our board who are assisting us with items um, are Gary Du and Olga. Um, both of them have prior experience inside of the PCB interest at uh, PCB industry. Um, Olga is a IPCC certified CID and CID plus instructor. Um, and she's also a technical educator and working at a couple other companies. Gary is a professional engineer who has experience in aerospace design. Um, Gary assists me by being the vice chair with Olga being in charge of our technical education. And if you would love to go and join our chapter core, um, and be a part of our chapter board, that would be fantastic. Please feel free to go ahead and reach out to us. Next slide, please. <laughs> the PCA executive board is made up of um, some very well-known people and you can kind of see some of the names that are listed here, um, including uh, Stephen Chavez, who is our chairman in charge of communications at the moment as well. Um, and some other big names such as Michael Creedon, Rick Hartley, Susie Webb, um, who are all educators who you would know from PCB East or PCB West. We also have a few other people who are industry names who are in charge of events, such as Mike Buteau um, and Eric, Erico Yamato. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. Um, so that's kind of an intro as to who the PCEA is, um, but now I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to Bert Simonovich. Um, Bert is a electronics engineering technologist and a senior member of the IEEE. He currently resides in Ottawa, Canada, and is actually a member of our chapter. Um, during his 32-year tenure at North Bell Research um, and later at Nortel, he's held a variety of different engineering positions. Um, in 2009, he founded his own company, Lansim Enterprises, where he provides high-speed signal integrity and backplane consulting. He currently serves on a couple of different boards as a technical advisor, uh, and his current research interests include high-speed signal integrity, modeling, and characterization of high-speed serial link architectures. His most notable modeling achievement is development of the cannibal Hurry conductor roughness model, which I believe he's going to give us some details of in his presentation today. Um, and he's used several electronic design automation software tools. So thank you very much, Bert, for joining us, and please go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Thomas, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Jeffrey and Polar, for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'll be talking about PCB fabrication and how dielectric and conductor properties can affect your high-speed PCB design performance. And before I continue, I think I'm going to shut the camera off in case there's some bandwidth issues. Um, we don't want any kind of glitches going there. So I should be shut off now. Okay, in preparing for today's talk, I thought I'd do a bit of research as to the early history of PCBs. And here's what I found out. In 1905, Albert Hansen was granted a patent for a device that was meant to improve telephone exchange boards. Although it doesn't look like PCBs we are familiar with today, it did include simple type of through-hole construction and even multi-layer wiring. Then in 1927, Charles Dukas used a stencil to print wires directly onto a board to conduct the electricity. This concept is much more recognizable as a PCB. Dukas also made claims of connecting multiple boards to create a multi-layered circuit board. But it wasn't until the early 1940s when Paul Eisler used his background in the printing industry to come up with one of the first practical uses of PCB for radio sets. It was used by the British and American forces during World War II. Moving ahead to the 50s and 60s, PCBs were mostly single-sided. Here's an example of a transistor radio. And other than the transistors, there was not too much advancement in PCB technology from Paul Eisler's radio. In the 1970s and 80s, through-hole and dual inline package ICs replaced transistors and double-sided PCBs were the norm. This is the famous Apple I motherboard from 1976. That was the year I graduated. Up until this point, no one knew the term signal integrity or even cared, because everything just worked. But from the 1990s to now, we saw explosive growth in surface mount technology with custom ASICs and FPGAs replacing individual logic ICs. This is the main PCB for the iPhone X. And as you can see, advanced PCB technology was needed to interconnect everything. And over this time, signal and power integrity became household words in the industry. And lastly, I came across this biodegradable PCB technology from Jiva, known as Soluboard. Apparently it will dissolve in hot water with non-toxic waste, allowing easier recycling of components to address environmental concerns. Over the last 25 years or so, we saw great advancements in the printed circuit technology. From 1995 to 2000, high speed was considered to be 500 to 1.25 gigabit per second. All we really cared about was controlled impedance and choosing the material with loss tangent of 0.01 or so. From 2001 to 2005, data rates were 2.5 to 3.8 gigabit per second. And at those rates, we began to worry about via stubs and started back drilling them on thick backplane designs. Then between 2005 and 2010, 
10 gigabit per second designs were becoming mainstream, and we saw the introduction of buried capacitance technology for improved power integrity. Tighter trace length matching constraints were also common to meet SKU budgets. But the biggest advance in PCB technology came over the last 10 years or so, where we saw bit rates go from 10 gigabit per second to 28 and now 56 gigabit per second. In 2017, 56 gig PAM4 was introduced. At these bit rates, everything matters. And as a result, we saw lower loss materials with tan delta on the order of 0 0.002 and smooth copper foils with roughness of uh, 0.1 or 1.5 microns or less. Via stubs were less than 10 mils. We used thick copper for IR drop mitigation. We started using spread weave glass for fiber weave effects and skew mitigation. And return loss and crosstalk meant tighter impedance control. So optimization of vias and other 3D structures became necessary, which often affect the PCB and layer selection. And in the end, costs have gone up to keep pace. So throughout your engineering career, you will find there are things you know, there are things you don't know, and there are the things you don't know you don't know that can ruin your day. And throughout my engineering career, this is what I often worried about. And that's why I continually tried to stay current through continuous research in my field. And here's a perfect example of what you don't know you don't know and how it can ruin your day. It's the 1940 Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse in Washington State. And in this case, what the engineers didn't know they didn't know was the effect of the wind. It was only 35 miles an hour, and as it blew across the bridge, it created air turbulence above and below the span. This resulted in torsional resonance leading to its collapse. All right, uh, now we'll get back to it. I'll touch on some of the high-speed signal integrity challenges we face in today's designs. The total loss of a transmission line is the sum of the conductor loss and the dielectric loss. Conductor loss is determined by the conductivity and the roughness of the conductor. Dielectric loss is determined by the dissipation factor, DF, or tan delta of the material. And it's important to model dielectric and conductor loss accurately. In this plot, we see an example of a simulated transmission line with and without conductor roughness. Starting at the top, the red curve is the conductor loss without roughness. The blue curve is the dielectric loss. The pink curve is the sum of the dielectric and the conductor loss without roughness. And finally, the last curve in green is the total loss with the conductor roughness included. Thus choosing the right material can make or break your high-speed PCB design. So why is this important? While many high-speed standards, like this IEEE 802.3 BS chip to module spec, has a strict loss budget of 10.2 dB from ball to ball. And modern top-of-rack pizza box routers have a central switch chip, fanning serial links to optical modules distributed along the front faceplate. The router lengths from the central switch chip to the outermost optical modules can be on the order of 8 to 10 inches with a maximum loss budget of 7.5 dB on the host board. Failure to choose the right dielectric and foil roughness can result in exceeding the loss budget and failing compliance. Since I will be talking about PAM4 signaling throughout this presentation, I thought I would give a high-level primer of what it is. In NRZ signaling, there are two levels, 0 and 1. There's one symbol per bit time, or UI. With the advent of PAM4, the proper name for two-level signaling is PAM2. This is the traditional PAM2 I diagram. Baud rate is the number of symbols per UI. For PAM2, the baud rate equals the bit rate. In PAM4, there are four levels. Two symbols are transmitted per UI. Effectively, that doubles the bit rate. 
And here's the PAM4 I diagram. And as you can see, there are four voltage levels and three I's. For PAM4, the baud rate is half the bit rate. So for example, 28 gigabaud equals 56 gigabits per second. And because there are four voltage levels, uh, there's a nine and a half dB reduction in the signal's noise ratio. Failure to account for conductor roughness can ruin your day, especially if you're trying to push 56 gig PAM4 signaling down your channel. And here we see with just 3.4 dB delta at 14 gigahertz, there's a decrease in vertical eye height of about 48% and a 16% increase in jitter with the rough copper at 56 gigabit per second. And then there's the failure to account for conductor roughness in RF design. And here's an example from a paper by Heidi Barnes and Jose Moriera, and uh, shows the red plot is the simulated results of an antenna resonant frequency when the roughness of the copper was not considered in the simulation. When they corrected the effective decay due to the roughness, the simulated frequency was much closer to the measurement. <clears throat> so here's what we'll learn today. I'll give a brief overview of PCB fabrication process. I'll talk about PCB stack up best practices. I'll give a little understanding of the fiberglass styles and how it affects fiber weave effect skew. I'll touch on conductor roughness and its effect on dielectric constant, characteristic impedance, the phase delay, and insertion loss. I'll show you how to extract and apply the right material properties from manufacturer's data sheets to use uh, for successful stack-up design in high-speed channel modeling. And then I'll go into some popular roughness models and how to get the right parameters for accurate loss modeling. Before any PCB can be fabricated, we need to start with the pre preg and laminate manufacturing process. So we'll begin with the raw materials. Similar to the textile industry, a fabric loom is used to make fiberglass cloth. When the glass fiber yarns are woven into fabric, the warp yarns run the length of the fabric roll, while the weft or fill yarns run the width. There are many resin systems used in the PCB industry. However, contrary to popular belief, there's no such thing as standard FR4. FR4 refers to a specific fire retardant level rather than a specific resin chemistry. So for example, here's a sample of list of different FR4 materials from Isola. And as you can see, all of them have different dielectric constants and loss tangent numbers, which will affect the performance of your design. Next, the glass fabric gets impregnated with resin during the A stage. And after going through a drying process, we end up with a finished pre preg sheets, also known as the B stage. At this point, the pre preg sheets are only partially cured and are quite flexible. There are two types of copper foils used in the PCB industry today. There's the rolled copper and electrodeposited copper. Rolled copper is smoother while ED copper is lower cost and the most popular. The last step takes the pre preg sheets and sandwiches them between two copper foil sheets. Then under heat and pressure, the final double-sided copper core laminate is produced. <clears throat> so the typical multi-layer PCB fabrication process is quite a complicated affair. It begins with a double-sided copper core laminate, then goes through a series of steps where the PCB artwork patterns are imaged onto each side of the core layers. Then unwanted copper is etched away, leaving the final artwork patterns. All the cores are then prepared and assembled into a layup, and everything will be glued together with pre preg sheets. After the lamination process, the panel goes through a series of steps to drill and plate the holes. The outer layers are then processed similar to the inner layer core process. Then finally, the last row involves finishing the outer layers, routing out the finished PCB from the panel, 
testing, inspecting, and finally shipping to the customer. And by no means this is uh, an exhaustive flowchart. It's really a high level and there are many steps uh, in between and each board shop will have their own um, uh, flow. But this gives you an idea of the complexity needed in the modern PCB multi-layer boards. So like any construction project, before you start building, you need a blueprint. And similarly, before you can do a layup of a PCB, you need a stack up drawing and detailed fabrication notes. A typical PCB stack up workflow might look something like this. First, determine the trace geometries needed to break out of your tightest pitch pin fields. Then you need to establish the number of power and routing layers. Next, choose your material and select the cores and prepregs. From there, you establish maximum thickness, then determine the minimum drill size based on the fab shop's maximum aspect ratio. And after that, perform impedance and loss modeling. And lastly, finalize the stack up. But to be successful, it involves a team approach with various stakeholders providing their input. When building a stack up, symmetry is key to minimizing warp and twist. If we start at the center with a double-sided core, we add layers symmetrically above and below the center line. We continue this process until the desired number of layers is reached. It is most common to have a prepreg layer adjacent to the top and bottom of the board. And because of this, the center layer might start off as a prepreg to ensure the stack up ends with a prepreg at the top and the bottom. Some other points to consider is to ensure there's equal copper weights or core laminate whenever possible. You should also have an adjacent ground plane for every power plane. This ensures good power integrity and noise suppression. When doing SI impedance modeling, you need to get the uh, dielectric data from the right sources. I like to think of it as a tale of two data sheets. Marketing data sheets, like the one shown here, are easily found on laminate suppliers' websites. They are meant for quick comparison to narrow your search. However, they are not representative of what is used in uh, the actual PCB stackup. Instead, you need to use the same DKDF tables used by your fab shop. These tables provide the actual core and prepreg thicknesses, resin content, and DKDF over the different frequencies for the different glass styles. But one thing for sure, using DKDF numbers from marketing data sheets for stack up and channel modeling will always give you an accurate results. So here's a few examples of standard woven glass styles offered by Isola. The fiberglass weaves are typically classified into different glass styles with unique numbers based on the uh, thread count and the thickness. And all glass styles are described in the IPC 4412A. MS glass, like 1067 and 1037, has the warp and the fill yarns mechanically spread to fill in the black resin rich square areas. MS glass was primarily developed to improve laser drilling for microvias. And it has been adopted for high speed PCBs to mitigate fiber weave effect skew, which I will discuss a bit later. The dielectric constant is the real part of the complex permittivity. It affects the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and the delay of the signal. The dissipation factor, or tan delta, is the tangent of the loss angle, and it affects the transmission loss of the signal. And as you can see by this graph, DK and DF are far from being constant over frequency. So once you've come up with the proposed stack up, the next step is to do some impedance modeling. Normally your fab shop comes up with this, but it's a good idea to validate their proposal to ensure you are in sync with them while you continue your channel modeling. 
The first thing to do is to identify the layers from which to model. Next is to use your 2D field solver to model characteristic impedance. Many fab shops use Polar Instruments field solver for impedance predictions. And since all field solvers are different, make sure you're, you understand the little nuances of your tool. And for me, I use the Polar quite regularly in my modeling, as you will probably see throughout here. The next thing to is to identify the core layers and input H1 and ER1. Then input the prepreg properties H2 and ER2. For polar, H2 is the sum of the prepreg and the trace thicknesses. But note, it's important to use the press thicknesses of the prepreg and not the thicknesses found in the DKDF tables. Here's a cross section of a typical diff pair geometry. And after pressing, the space between the traces is mostly resin. So if your field solver allows for it, fill in the decay of the resin. And after that, optimize the line width and space until the desired characteristic impedance is reached. And one last point to remember is that all 2D field solvers only calculate the lossless characteristic impedance. <clears throat> So here's the issue. We design the stack up, then we do our SI modeling analysis based on the stack up parameters. Board shops use the TDR to measure characteristic impedance, but more often than not, it's not what was predicted. This is because the 2D field solver only calculates the lossless characteristic impedance of the cross-sectional geometry. It has no input for conductor resistivity, dielectric loss, or how long the conductor is. Resistive loss often results in a slow monotonic rise in the impedance profile, as shown here. IPC TM650 specifies the measurement zone between 30 and 70 percent. Most fab shops will measure an average impedance over this range. But the true characteristic impedance is at the beginning of the TDR plot. And in this example, for a low loss dielectric, we see there is a 4 to 5 ohm difference compared to the true characteristic impedance depending on where the measurement is taken. And if you're worried about insertion loss, you need to consider the copper foil roughness on adjacent reference planes. Often thin core laminate power and ground planes will specify RTF foils. But if the adjacent layer to, this, uh, to those reference planes is a high speed layer, with smooth copper, then both reference planes should have the same copper roughness as the adjacent signal layer. Failure to do so can result in a higher insertion loss for that layer and perhaps ruin your day. In this example, with over 4 inches of trace, there's a delta of 0.8 dB at 14 gigahertz and 1.7 dB at 28 gigahertz. And since we're moving towards 112 gigabit per second for the next generation systems, that will cut into your loss budget and noise margin. And finally, you can see the effect of roughness on the effective decay, which will ultimately affect your impedance. So next, to ensure you get consistent builds from one fab shop to another, you really need to include a detailed stack up construction as shown here in your fab nodes. Since every fab shop has their own stack up template, all information needed for successful 28 gigabaud and above is not always included. And worse, many customer fabrication nodes are inadequate for successful signal integrity analysis. It's important to include the glass styles and the resin content. Every glass style will have a different weave pattern and thickness, and often you can get two different glass styles and resin content for the same thickness. And one may be a standard weave, but what you really want is the spread weave. But unless you explicitly capture it, the fab shop will choose to do what's best for their process. Copper foil weights should be included and match the thicknesses as well. And for critical high-speed designs, you should include copper roughness to make sure it meets your loss budget. If not, there's no way for the fabricator to know what you really want. It may choose a default foil, which is often rougher than expected. 
And of course, the line width and space geometries, as well as calculated impedance, is normal for fabrication nodes. But what is often not captured is the etch factor of the trace and frequency used for DKDF for the impedance calculations. All right, next I'll touch a bit on fiber weave effect, sometimes referred to as glass weave skew. So what is fiber weave effect anyways? Well, it's when there's a timing skew between two or more transmission lines of the same length caused by the glass weave. If we start with two complementary signals, D plus and D minus, with no skew, the differential signal is not distorted and there is no common signal. And when there is a timing skew between D plus and D minus, some of the differential signal will be converted to a common signal. And ultimately, this leads to eye closure and contributes to EMI radiation. Failure to control fiber weave effect can make or break your high speed design. Here's an example of fiber weave effect on a lossless differential pair. In reality, though, there's no such thing as a lossless transmission line, but it's used here to isolate any losses due to the uh, skew. On the left is a 26.56 gigabaud PAM4i with zero picoseconds of skew. With 0.2, uh, 0.2 UI of fiber weave effect and 9.86 picoseconds per inch of skew, that represents about 0.8 inches. 0.2 UI of skew will cause a resonant null in the insertion loss plot at five times the Nyquist frequency of the baud rate. In this case, the Nyquist frequency is 13.28 gigahertz, and the resonant null is at about 66 gigahertz. We also note approximately 0.4 dB loss at 13.28 gigahertz. And at the far end, the eye shows we lose about three millivolts of eye height and about one and a half picoseconds increase in jitter. But when we increase the skew to half of the UI, we observe the resonant notch moves to the baud rate and, lose, and the loss increases to minus three dB. And the eye height reduces to 172 millivolts and jitter increases by about 10 picoseconds. And finally, at a full one UI of skew, the resonant notch moves to exactly the Nyquist frequency and the eyes are totally closed. So here's a real world example of fiber weave effect skew. The same design was built using two different materials and glass styles. The one on the left is a stack up with Nelco 4000-13 EPSI using 1080 glass. On the right is a Meg 6 stack up but with 1035, 1078 spread weave glass. With the 1080 glass weave, we see variation of the impedance between the P and N and six picoseconds of skew. But with the 1035, 1078 glass, the variation between P and N is similarly behaved and there was no skew. As a rule of thumb though, we budget about 20% of the baud rate for skew. So for 28 gigabaud, that's roughly seven picoseconds. And as you can see, we have almost reached that budget with the 1080 glass. So here's a graph plotting the fiber weave effect skew versus gigabaud rate. It's based on 9.86 picoseconds per inch of skew. And as you can see, the length of the fiber weave effect skew decreases exponentially with an exponential increase in baud rate. At one gigabaud, we can live with about 20 inches of, uh, of skew. So it's unlikely to be an issue, <clears throat> excuse me. But as we go past 10 gigabaud, we need to start paying attention. At 16 gigabaud, which is PCIe Gen 4, the skew budget is 1.27 inches. At 32 gigabaud, Gen 5, it's 0.63 inches. And at 56 gigabaud, which is the baud rate for 112 gigabit per second, it's only 0.36 inches, a little over a quarter inch. That's not much margin. You may need to pay more attention to these links. 
And here's a more practical example of an IEEE 802.3 chip to module channel. The insertion loss shown in red meets the insertion loss mask with some margin. The minimum I height spec is 32 millivolts and the I width spec is 8.28 picoseconds. And as you can see, the I passes with margin. <clears throat> When we add 0.2 UI of skew, or 7.5 picoseconds, we see the insertion loss being pulled closer to the insertion loss mask. This is due to the resonant notch we saw in the previous slide. We can't see the notch because it's beyond the bandwidth of the measurement. But in this example, the eye height and width are reduced, but they're still within spec. When we add only 2.5 more picoseconds of skew, the insertion loss fails the insertion loss mask at 21 gigahertz, and the resulting eye height just fails the 32 millivolt spec. Now, if the measured loss happened to line up exactly on the insertion loss mask with no skew, the eye height would most likely have failed with 0.2 UI of, of skew budget. This suggests the skew budget may be insufficient for PAM4 signaling. And remember, 0.2 UI was total skew budget from all sources. So we would need to reduce the fiber weave effect skew even further. There are several ways used to control fiber weave effect skew. One method is to choose the spread weave glass pattern. Another way is to choose the differential pair pitch to, met, to match the glass weave pitch. Uh, this will only hold true as long as use the same glass dial um, above and below the um, uh, differential pairs, for instance, in a strip line. Zigzag or freehand random routing works too, but it might, may not always be practical. And finally, rotating the artwork seven to 10 degrees on the panel is often used, but it has cost implications because it often requires a larger panel size to fit everything. For many people, they complain about the additional cost. But my argument is, over the years, we have accepted cost increases for some of the following. There's high layer counts, low loss material, smoother copper, and especially back drilling of via stubs. The reason we back drill vias uh, is, is because of the stub resonance and it has the same devastating effect on the eye as fiber weave effect does. And we don't have people complaining about this anymore. And because of the shrinking skew budgets, sometimes no one method is sufficient. So one or more of the above techniques are used. Okay, uh, now I'll get into conductor roughness. And as you will see, it's not all about adhesion anymore. In the real world, there's no such thing as a perfectly smooth PCB conductor surface. Roughness is always applied to promote adhesion to the dielectric material during lamination and rework. Given a conductor with a width and thickness shown here, current is uniform through the entire cross-sectional area. The resistance per unit length can be easily calculated by this equation given the uh, resistivity of the material. <clears throat> but, above, but above 10 megahertz or so, AC current starts to flow mainly along the skin of the conductor. The skin depth is effective thickness where AC current flows and is calculated by this equation. And as you can see from this graph, skin depth decreases inversely proportional to the square root of frequency. At DC, current is uniform through the cross section in both of these cases. But as you can see, in addition to skin effect, the roughness causes additional loss due to absorption and scattering as the wave propagates along the transmission line. To better understand conductor roughness, I will start with the electrodeposited copper foil fabrication process. 
A large drum made of titanium or stainless steel is partially submerged into a vat of copper sulfate solution. An electric potential is applied between the drum, cathode, and solution. As the drum slowly rotates, copper is electrodeposited onto it. The thickness of the foil is controlled by the speed of the drum. It's important, the important takeaway from this slide is to note that the drum and the mat side of the foil. The mat side is the side facing the solution, while the drum is the side contacting the drum. The drum side of the foil is always smoother than the mat side. Another important nuance with modeling is copper weight versus thickness. The thickness of the copper is based on the weight in ounces over one square foot of area. Most engineers assume the thickness is shown here. But IPC 4562A actually gives a nominal thickness of plus minus 10%. Which means the copper you get will likely be on the low end of the spec because of the copper cost. Then by the time the PCB is processed, you will end up with these typical values. But after processing, the spec allows a further reduction. So these are the worst case numbers you should be using for your SIPI modeling. After coming out of the electrodeposited fabrication process, the drum on the mat side of the foils looks something like this. The foil then goes through a nodule treatment process where tiny nodules are deposited on one side of the foil. The standard process deposits tiny nodules onto the mat side of the foil, shown here. But when nodules are deposited onto the drum side, it's commonly known as reverse treated foil or drum side feet treated foil. There are three common foil roughnesses used in the PCB industry today. The most common is the standard profile and has been used for years. It has no minimum or maximum roughness spec. So the rougher, the better to meet the peel strength and other requirements. But as roughness became an issue with signal losses, IPC came up with a very low profile or VLP spec. The VLP foil is typically any foil with a roughness of less than 5.2 microns. And then there's the ultra low profile uh, copper, which is a newer class of copper foil with roughness of less than, point, or less than two microns but it's because there's no uh, official IPC specification yet, you'll see a proprietary names like HVLP, ULP, VSP, VLP2, whatever the company marketing team decides to call it. And this is a big in issue in the PCB industry because there's so many names and lots of confusion. And because of that, it's hard to specify it in the fab notes or even model it correctly for signal integrity. Profilometers are often used to measure surface roughness. This process involves dragging a tiny stylus tip across a test sample where the 2D roughness profile is recorded. And by convention, every 2D roughness profile is defined by a capital letter R followed by a subscript. The subscript then identifies the formula that was used to report the roughness. Typical roughness parameters found on data sheets are shown here. The 10 point mean roughness, RZ, is the most common for the treated side of the foil. It's the sum of the average of the five highest peaks and the five lowest valleys of the measured roughness profile over the sample length. But sometimes average roughness, RA, is reported for the drum side, and RMS roughness, RQ, may or may not be reported. In my experience, I found there's much confusion in the industry, depending on who you talk to or literature that you read. Often, marketing FAEs will report RZ numbers as RMS roughness. And in literature or even websites, RA and RQ often gets mistyped because the A and the Q fonts are similar. 
And that's why I always like to go to the foil manufacturer's data sheet to get the right numbers. The nodule treated side is the side that is always bonded to the core. For standard treated foil, it's the mat side. And for reverse treated foil, it's the drum side. It's important to keep that in mind when you're doing your modeling for your roughness. During PCB fabrication, untreated copper on each side of the core laminate undergoes a roughening treatment to promote adhesion to the prepreg. There are two types of treatments, oxide and oxide alternative. In the case of oxide treatment, oxide crystals are grown to roughen the surface. It's non-conductive and does not significantly alter the underlying copper surface profile. On the other hand, there are two types of oxide alternative treatments. The first is an etching process, where the surface profile is etched to provide a mechanical bond to the prepreg. Non-etch oxide alternative treatment is a chemical bonding process and does not significantly alter the underlying copper surface profile. <clears throat> In 2017, Jim Fuller from the HD Pug User Group published a paper at IPEX Expo. They basically studied six leading oxide alternative treatments. In the table shown here, roughness numbers are listed and compared to the base copper. A, B, and C were etched type, while D, E, and F samples were non-etched type. These two pictures are example roughness profiles for etching and non-etching on the drum side of the foil. The etched sample picture clearly shows the underlying profile has been altered significantly and looks quite rough compared to the non-etched samples, where you can see the underlying roughness profile of the drum surface is still there. Here I did a simulation study of a MEG-6 test geometry. The only thing I changed was the roughness parameters listed in the HD Pug study. As expected, the smoother the roughness shows improvement in the insertion loss, especially extending to 50 gigahertz. At 14 gigahertz, there's 0 0.07 dB per inch delta between sample B and sample D. At 28 gigahertz, this delta increases to 0.16 dB per inch. This suggests that for our current 56 gig standards, the etch oxide alternatives are probably not that much of an issue, as long as the etch treatment is tightly controlled by the PCB fabricator. But for future 112 gig system standards, it could be an issue. Everyone involved in the design and manufacture of printed circuit boards knows one of the most important properties of the dielectric material is dielectric constant. When you compare the simulation against measurements, you will often see a discrepancy in the effective decay due to increased phase delay caused by surface roughness. And in this example, it was 36%. The red was the actual measured sample and the blue was the simulated. So why is that? Well, the answer is, effective decay is highly dependent on how it was measured. One common method used by many laminate suppliers is a clamped strip line resonator test method as described by IPC TM650. It was designed to rapidly test dielectric material in a production environment. The measurements are made under strip line conditions using a resonant element pattern card made out of the same dielectric material to be tested. The card is then sandwiched between two sheets of uncladded dielectric material under test. And the whole structure is then clamped between two large plates lined with copper foil reference planes. Since this method only assures consistency and quality of a product, it does not guarantee the values will directly correspond to design applications. Published DKDF tables are not the same as the effective decay due to the roughness. This is a key point to keep in mind, and here's why. Because the resonant element pattern card and the material under test are not physically bonded together, air is entrapped due to the roughness of the various constituencies shown here. And as a result, the published decay is not the same as the effective decay due to the roughness. 
This is further explained by the decay effect of roughness model I developed. Normally, DKDF tables publish decay, effective decay assuming the smooth foil of the fixture. If we model the structure with a decay effective of 4, we see the uniform electric field lines. For this example, the capacitance with smooth copper is 141 puff. But in reality, the finished laminate sees the roughness tooth profile embedded into the cured dielectric. When we simulate the structure, we see the capacitance increases to 175 puff. Defective height H rough can be approximated as H smooth minus 2 RZ. The ratio of DK effective rough to DK, DK effective equals the ratio of C rough to C smooth. With a little bit of math, we can calculate DK effective due to the roughness as 4.968. And when we use this number into a new smooth foil model, we get the same effective capacitance of 175 puff. This model can be reduced to this simple equation. This is the effective decay you need to use in your favorite field solver for characteristic impedance calculation if you know the roughness of the foil. And here's the simulation correlation when decay effective due to roughness is applied. The red plot is the measured data, the blue plot is the simulation using data sheet values for DK, and the green plot is using DK effective due to the roughness. And as you can see, we get excellent results. <clears throat> okay, next we'll go into modeling conductor roughness. To begin with, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is a famous quote by George E.P. Box, who was a famous statistician in the mid 20th century. But in the SIPI world, we can change it to say, all simulation models are wrong, but some are useful. A triangular roughness model is useful for estimating RMS roughness. If we start with this roughness profile, we can calculate and plot the 10 point mean roughness RZ, and then do the same thing for the RMS value RQ. Then if we assume a triangular roughness profile with a peak to peak height equal to RZ, then the RMS height delta equals RZ divided by two root three. And likewise, if we assume delta is approximately equal to RQ, and you need RZ, then RZ is approximately equal to RQ times 2 root 3. <clears throat> In 1949, S.P. Morgan pioneered the modeling of surface roughness using square and triangular grooves. He later published a paper showing the relative power dissipation for different values of RMS roughness to skin depth. In 1980, Hammerstedt and Jensen did some further study and proposed an empirical fit formula for calculating KSR based on Morgan's equilateral triangle results. In this equation, delta is the RMS value of the peak to valley tooth height. It's not the same as RMS RQ found in the data sheets. Instead, you can use my triangular roughness model I described in the previous slide using RZ. And here we can compare Morgan's equation to determine RMS delta versus my triangular roughness equation. We see they're the same thing. The Hammerstein and Jensen model has served us well over the years, but it loses accuracy above 3 to 15 gigahertz, depending on the roughness of the copper. So something else was needed. Then at DesignCon 2010, Dr. Paul Hurry uh, presented his Hooray model. It was based on the non-uniform distribution of spheres resembling snowballs applied to a matte base. The model relied on SEM photos of the roughness profile, then assumed stacked snowballs are arranged in a hexagonal lattice arrangement. You would then estimate the peak-to-peak -peak separation, stack height, and sphere radius, then you would create a lattice picture and figure out how many spheres to be stacked on a hexagonal tile base. 
In this case, with one micron sphere radius and peak-to-peak -peak separation of 9.4 microns, we can fit a minimum of 11 spheres, up to a maximum of 38 spheres. Then you'd play with the number of spheres until you fit the measurement. And as you can see, the model fit very well. But the main issue with the Hooray model is that it's cumbersome to get the right parameters without a lot of trial and error in tuning to a measured test sample. So this leads to the cannonball hooray model I developed. Using the method of stacking cannonballs aboard ships, the sphere radius and base area parameters for the original hooray model can now be easily estimated solely by the roughness parameters as published in the manufacturer's data sheets. We start with a square tile base. Then we stack nine spheres on top of the first, floor, first row, four spheres in the middle row, and one sphere on top. Now, if we can magically peer into the stack and visualize a pyramid lattice structure connecting to all the centers of the spheres, then the total height of the cannonball stack is equal to the height of two pyramids plus the diameter of a sphere. The height of the cannonball stack is equal to delta using my triangular roughness model. Through the simple geometry and a little bit of algebra, we can approximate the radius of a single sphere equal to 0.06 rz and the base area equal to 36 r squared. Because the model assumes the ratio of a mat to a flat equals 1, and there are only 14 spheres total, the cannonball hooray model can be simplified to this equation. And as you can see, the radius is the only parameter needed, which can be easily determined by rz. The beauty of my cannonball model is that it offers the simplicity of the Hammerstein model, but has the accuracy of the original Hooray model. So if you're, using, if you're used to using the Hammerstein model in your workflow, you should find this model just as easy to use. All right, now I'm going to show you how to apply my cannonball model to popular EDA tools using the Hooray model. Many of them ask for input parameters that are, that are not easily apparent unless you go searching for them in their help manual. But even then, it's not much help. The tools shown here include the Cannonball Hooray model as an option. So all that's needed is RZ roughness for the mat and the drum side of the foil. And as an aside, Polar was the first company to adopt my Cannonball Hooray model, and I thank them for that. ANSYS and Cadence require surface ratio and nodule radius for input parameters. Surface ratio is the part of the Hooray model. Because R squared cancels out, SR can be simplified to a constant 4.9, and nodule radius is calculated as 0.06 RZ. And that's all you need to do for these tools. Symbior, an LTM designer, requires only two parameters roughness factor RF1 and sphere radius SR1. Similarly, RF1 can be simplified to a constant 8.33 and SR1, again, 0.06 RZ. And finally, as of release 2022, Keysight ADS has adopted the Hooray model and needs these four parameters. You can still use my cannonball stack method by using 14 for n, ratio of a equals 1, and then 0.06 rz for r, and 36 r squared for a flat. So in all these cases, if you know rz, um, you can uh, use these tools. So where do we get the FOIL roughness numbers from? Well, ideally, you would get them from FOIL supplier's data sheets. For example, this is data sheet from Mitsuri showing four common roughness profiles. Another source can be from laminate suppliers, but you have to be careful because not all laminate suppliers interpret the roughness numbers correctly and often get RZ and RQ mixed up. It's best to contact them directly and ask for the actual foil type from the foil suppliers that they use. And finally, you can get these numbers with prior simulation correlation or other publications in the industry.
Similarly, you can get the oxide alternative roughness numbers from the supplier's data sheets, but they're not as easy to find. Failing that, you can get them from prior simulation correlation or even from past publications, or perhaps even from your fab shop if they share that information. Here's an example of interlayer surface treatment study done by Scott Hanaga back in 2014, which lines up well with the CZ8100 in the data sheet. <clears throat> Here's another example of a typical foil data sheet. But as you can see, there are two RZ numbers for the mat and the drum side, JIS and ISO. So the question is, which RC do I use? Which RZ do I use? When we look up RZ ISO in the TM650 test methods manual, RZ ISO is not recognized as a roughness parameter. Asian foil suppliers tend to use the JIS method, which is the same as the 10 point mean method. TM650 recognizes RZ DIN. It's similar, but instead of measuring the sum of the average of the five highest peaks and the five lowest valleys, it measures five peak to peak heights over a sample length and then averages them out. So I thought I would give a brief demonstration of modeling through a little case study here. I will use this Examax demonstrator backplane I helped develop along with VIA systems and FCI back in 2013 timeframe. The first thing to do is get the stack up from the board shop. Next, gather up the necessary data sheets from the materials for the dielectric we use in the DKDF tables. Then it's useful to summarize all the parameters into a table. After that, determine the effective decay due to the roughness using my decay effective correction model. And lastly, determine the hooray parameters of the mat and the drum side using my cannonball stack model. I will use Polar for the modeling transmission lines. And this is what you see when you first open up the software. The first thing to do is click on the lossless calculation tab to enter the 2D field solver. Here's where you will adjust the parameters to determine the characteristic impedance. And once you're happy, you click the frequency dependent calculation tab. And here we enter the DK, DF, and frequency using the DK effective numbers calculated in the previous slide. And make sure you use the uh, uh, causal uh, radio button there uh, when you enter these parameters. Next, we choose the Hooray roughness model and input the RZ parameters of the mat and drum side directly. And when you do that, uh, it'll calculate everything else for you um, uh, for the Hooray model. Then next, we'll uh, enter the length of the transmission line and then hit the Calculate button. And after the simulation, you will see the results for the insertion loss. And finally, uh, we export the results into a touchstone file for further channel modeling simulation. So here's the generic topology channel model, and it's built in uh, Keysight ADS. Uh, it's quite a nice tool for doing this kind of work, but you can use any tool that can concatenate to all the all the S parameters of your channel. And uh, this one also, you can do IBIS AMI modeling at the same time for the uh, look at eye diagrams and things like that. So after you built the model and done your simulation, here's the results of the, uh, the one channel we had I modeled and simulated. It's the 20.25 uh, inch uh, channel on the back plane. And as you can see here, the red is the measured results of the channel, and the blue is the simulation. And this bottom is the TDR plot of the whole channel of the two daughter cards in the back plane. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, pretty good considering uh, we're going through two daughter cards in the back plane and the connectors and there's other impairments. So um, it's pretty good from just using data sheet values. 
and using the IBIS AMI modeling feature in uh, the Keysight ADS tool, uh, we can get some eye diagrams shown here. The top ones are at the near end or at the transmitter end. Uh, the ones at the left are the simulation, and the ones on the right are the actual measurements. And you can see the measurement at the uh, at the source is a little bit uh, noisier, and that's because of all the impairments. Uh, penis matching, the vias are also included, which I didn't include in this simulation. And uh, as a result, uh, this is also uh, the stack up of the 1080 material that I showed earlier for the SKU, that uh, that part of it had six, uh, six picoseconds. So it includes some SKU effects as well. But as you can see though, the eye opening is uh, Pretty good. They're they're pretty they're pretty the same almost the same opening. Um, so at this point, uh, you know, at your high level design, you can choose to include the vias or not and go and model them uh, to be very detailed. But uh, you might not need to uh, at this point. So in summary, then uh, for high speed serial link designs above 10 gigabit per second, everything matters. And I've shown you how conductor roughness can affect your dielectric properties. So choosing an expensive low loss material but not paying attention to conductor roughness in your stack up can uh, reduce your loss margin and potentially fail compliance. And you're wasting a lot of money for spending uh, money on a high performance dielectric and using rougher copper on it. So failure to choose proper glass styles in your stack up can also lead to fiber weave effect skew and cause degraded performance. So you can find some other references. Um, off my website, I have uh, archived much of the research papers that I've published under the publications tab. And I've also published several white papers on different subjects relating to signal integrity. And I also uh, run a little blog. Um, it's not always uh, too regular, but uh, when I have something interesting I like to share, I, I kind of put it in the blog. And it's uh, often shorter versions of the white paper and points back to it. So uh, you can get access to that through my website as well. And uh, that's all I have today. I uh, thank you for attending and having interest.